why do you use absolute risk instead of relative risk? You guys are just fudging the numbers. You just kind of want to make it look good, blah, blah, blah. Like, look, every day I get people on my social media accounts are like, well, what was the absolute risk? Why are you reporting only the relative risk? Like, people just stop. We report everything. There is no conspiracy theory to hide the absolute risks. They are all in the actual study right at the top, at the bottom, in the results. It's like these people that are like, who funded the study? You've never read science before. You are literally raising your hand being like, hi, I have never read a study in my life. At the top, it says conflicts of interest and funding. It says who funded every single study. You must report it. It's not hidden. It's not a conspiracy. Um, so let's talk about this. We're going to talk about absolute risk versus relative risk. And I'm going to show you why both matter and how you can analyze the data to figure this out. So if you don't know me, I'm Dr. Al. I'm a board certified cardiologist. I've been teaching cardiology at two medical schools for a very long time. And I teach online. You can follow me on every social media platform. Some of them are very short little videos. Some of them are text-based. And some of them are long videos and podcasts like this. If you go to Dr. Allo's show, just search Dr. Allo's show in your favorite podcast player. You can find the audio version of this. Now, let's talk about this absolute risk and I'll put the graphs up because I think visually it just makes way more sense. So let's talk about the numbers first. So let's say there's a 10% chance of having a heart attack if you eat a grape and I'm just making this up. If I don't eat the grape, the risk drops to 9%. So that is a 1% absolute risk reduction from 10% to 9%. 1% absolute risk reduction. However, if you look at the relative risk reduction, there was a 10 in 100 chance of me having a heart attack. And if I don't eat the grape, it's only nine out of 100. So that is a 10% reduction in relative risk instead of a 10%. Now it's 9%. That's a 1% or a 10% relative risk reduction. Why do these numbers matter? Because a lot of people are like, well, you guys always report the relative risk when it's the absolute risk that you should report because they're so much smaller. So let's humor these people. Let's say a medication like aspirin reduces risk of stroke by 1% absolute. And let's say for whatever reason, it translates into a 32% relative risk reduction. We could be like, listen, relatively speaking, 32% risk, risk reduction in strokes for people who are 45 and smoke and have diabetes, right? And then they're like, well, but it's only a 1% reduction, absolutely. Okay, so does that mean you're not gonna take the aspirin? Like, I'm trying to understand the point. What are you trying to say? You don't wanna take aspirin because it's just 1% reduction? Like, I'm not understanding the logic that these people have. So then you, you kind of talk to them a little more. You're like, okay, fine. Multiply that by 9 billion people. There's almost 9 billion people on Earth. Let's say it's a 0.5% risk of reduction in terms of deaths from heart disease. We put people on aspirin. Or, or anything. Let's say exercise. You start exercising, lift some weights. If you can, if you can do 40 push-ups, which is true, this is a study that was done. If you can do 40 push-ups, your risk of heart attack over the next year or 10 years, whatever it might be, is 1% absolutely risk lower. Or let's say 0.5, you know, for fun. Now we multiply that out times 100, then 10,000, then 100,000, then a million, a billion. And now there's 9 billion people on earth. If we can get all 9 billion people to do push-ups and do at least 40 a day, now that 0.5% uh, absolute risk reduction, instead of just saving half a person out of 100, multiply that by 9 billion. That's probably, I don't know, I did not do the math. 20, 30 million lives saved a year, something like that, maybe more, I don't know. So it's, it's an absolutely ridiculous argument. So scientists eventually came up with ways to explain this that make a little more sense. So I'm going to put up some graphs here and then it's going to be like blatantly obvious why this matters. So let's say there's a person who's 45 years old who smokes. Their chance of developing lung cancer is 3% versus the 45 year old next to them that uh, quit smoking. They're, they also smoked and they quit. Their chance of developing lung cancer is now 2%. And I'll put the graph up here. It goes from 3% to 2%. That is a 1% absolute risk reduction, right? But a 33% relative risk reduction. You're going from you're going from 3 to 2, which is a 33% reduction, relative risk reduction in developing lung cancer. It's still under 5%, right? No big deal. Now let's carry that out over the next 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. The person that continues to smoke 
beyond 45, beyond the age 50, that line of absolute risk reduction skyrockets. It goes way, way up. Uh, it is tremendous, you know, almost to the point of absolute certainty. If you continue to smoke till you're 80 or 90 or 70 or whatever it is, you almost certainly will have lung cancer. That's not really a question. There are some people that don't, you know, 10, 15% of people or whatever it might be. I don't know the statistics now. I'm not a lung doctor, but there is a percentage of people that will not get lung cancer and not die from that. Maybe they'll die of heart disease or something different. The other people, the other person that quit by age 50 and never smoked, their relative risk of lung cancer is their risk of their absolute risk of lung cancer is still there. You know, it continues out and you know, it's up here, but it's super low. It's still at the end of the day under 5% by age 85 or 90 or whatever it is. Their risk of having lung cancer is still below 5%. Can they still get it even though they quit 40 years ago? Yeah, absolutely. They still did smoke and there's still that chance. If you notice what the curves separate pretty quickly, the one kind of stays flat and it's still under 5%, the other one skyrockets and now you have like this tremendous amount of risk of having actual lung cancer to the point of absolute certainty. The absolute risk eventually dwarfs the uh, relative risk. Now, let's carry this out to lipid lowering therapy. If your LDL cholesterol, let's say, is 110, or you know, let's use the PISA trial. The PISA trial, LDL cholesterol of 110, by age 40, you have a 45% chance, well, you, you have 45% of those people, 50%, let's say, just to keep the math simple. If your LDL is 100, 50% of people have plaque, right? Not hard math. If you leave that alone and you continue at that high level of LDL cholesterol, it was 110 actually in the study, half of those people, the plaque is going to continue to get worse. The other half might not have it as bad, but it also continues to get worse, but it's not as bad. If we were to lower your risk by putting you on medications, a new diet, whatever it might be, your relative risk will drop quite a bit. Your absolute risk will drop also not as much, that it depends on the area under the curve. The time under the curve of the new lower therapy, whether it's statin medications, PCSK9s, low saturated fat diet, whatever the intervention was, you know, exercise, although exercise doesn't really lower your cholesterol much, but whatever the intervention was, the people in the intervention arm had a much lower LDL cholesterol. Over a longer period of time, the area under the curve is much bigger and your risk of now having atherosclerosis or a heart attack or stroke or any of those things with ASCVD is much, much lower. So it really makes no sense to say, why are you only reporting the relative risk? Well, first of all, we report both. There's no like, no one is uh, hiding it. It's not some conspiracy. People think it's some magical conspiracy. They, they throw out this graph of cholerestamine, which was this old bile acid sequestrant that they love to use. They're like, well, look, the risk of heart attack not on medicine was 9.8%, and on medicine, it was 8.2 or 8.1, something like that, I don't know, something really low. And they have these exaggerated bar graphs to make it look worse. And, and I'll put that graphic up here. They say, well, look, do you really wanna, does it really matter? Should we really put people on cholesterol or you know, bile acid sequestrants because they have almost literally zero effect? Well, this is nonsense. This is a way of using graphics to manipulate the data by having the things look, you know, way bigger uh, than they actually are. When you look at actual graphs and charts with areas under the curve and who actually lived longer and who didn't, the longer you are on therapy, the less likely you are to have atherosclerosis. And since that's the number one killer, the less likely you are to die of heart disease. You may absolutely die of something else. Or if your LDL goes up later, you quit medications, or you have already accumulated damage, different story if you started late. But if you, at a young enough age, started out on some type of lipid-lowering intervention or were just born with genetically low cholesterol, you know, hypo-beta-lipoproteinemia, if you're born with an LDL of 15 to 25, you're not going to get heart disease. If we treat you with diet interventions, exercise interventions, uh, lipid interventions, therapies, medications, whatever, and get your LDL that low, you're not going to have heart disease. You will absolutely die. We cannot prevent that. And we may add decades to your life. We don't really know. Some of these medications and lipid lowering therapies are newer. What we do know is that the number of people dying of heart disease continues to go down every year. We've had a 80 to 90% reduction of death from heart disease since the 1930s, 1960s, and another 22% in the last 10 years, which is good. But... 
Oh, and this despite a higher burden of chronic disease. More people are diabetic, you know, slightly. More people are hypertensive. More people are obese. More people, you know, they're about the same. Smoking has gone down, but it's still, it hovers about the same now for the last, you know, 20 years or so. But even with a higher burden of obesity and hypertension and other, you know, chronic illness, metabolic disease, we're still having significant reductions in death from heart disease. So over a long enough time horizon, we don't know, but most likely you, we're going to see people live even longer, assuming we solve the cancer stuff and some of these other things. Um, so this argument of like absolute risk versus low relative risk, is just a bunch of nonsense. This is just noise from people who want you to kind of miss the forest for the trees or they are minoring in the majors or majoring in the minors, I should say. And it's just a bunch of nonsense. These people literally have no idea what they're talking about. These are like the, you know, people on Twitter, they're like, what about relative risk and absolute risk? What's the absolute risk reduction on this? Like, do you even understand science? You're the same guy that just asked me who funded the study. Do you not know that you can just click on it and read the funding? It's not hard. You know, if you studied science and, and, and basic, you know, statistics, you should know how to figure out who funded the study? And if you think the funding affected the study, then please let us know your analysis. Otherwise, please shut the hell up because you have no idea what you're talking about. Um, but anyways, this is just one of those things. We have a whole chapter on this in my uh, new cholesterol book. Go to dralonet slash cholesterol and you can be the first to know when this book comes out. I think you're going to love it. Um, put a lot of time into it. It's been 18 months now, 16 to 18 months. And myself and Dr. Thomas Dayspring have been, he's been the lipid editor mainly. You know, we're going back and forth a lot. I've written the, you know, 85, 90, 90% of the rest of it. There's over 760 citations. Literally every sentence, every claim I make has 300 studies to support it. Maybe not 300, but at least one, maybe sometimes some of them 10 or 15. So definitely go to dralonet slash cholesterol, fill out the form. You'll get a preview of the book. You'll get some cool graphics. You'll get my lipid guide. You'll get my longevity pack, my free longevity pack. You'll love that. And if you like this kind of stuff and you want to talk to me every day and even do live Zooms with me every week, go to dralonet slash community. And uh, I'd love to see you on the inside. I think you'll love it. Um, if not, you can always cancel. No big deal. But definitely share this stuff with other people who need to know this because it's getting a little crazy out there. People literally think they discovered some magical science that nobody else has access to when it's like not that exciting. We've known this forever. What are you even saying and why does this matter to you so much? Because it usually flips upside down some weird theories and conspiracies that they have about LDL or cholesterol or smoking or eating right, eating meat, eating saturated fat, whatever it might be, which is usually a bunch of nonsense. But anyways, hope this helps. Uh, I'll catch you in the next episode. Peace.